Um, it's a first person narrator whose history is suggested as she talks about other things. But what I'm also talking about, and again, this is a case of the categories sort of breaking down, is really voice. The single most critical, ineluctable, necessary element of good fiction, in my opinion. It's very hard to explain what voice even is. I had a letter, a note from a stranger recently via email saying, I just have a few questions. Can you just quickly explain how, as a writer, I can find my own voice? He actually used the word quickly. <laughs> and I thought, well, uh, not really. I'm still trying to figure that out, too. Um, so it is hard to even explain, I mean, far from being able to explain how to find it, I'm not even sure how to explain what it is, beyond saying that it's the way a book talks. The best metaphor I can think of, and I actually think it's kind of a good one, um, is that voice is the equivalent of a cooking stock. It's w without a good stock, the best ingredients in the world are not going to add up to anything. If they, what, the whole will not be more than the sum of the parts. But with a really good stock, you can throw in almost anything. You can put a boot in there and it will be delicious. That's how I think voice is. That's how important I think voice is. Um, good dialogue relies on exactly the same kind of compression and history. Word choices that tell us not only what someone is saying, obviously, um, but much more importantly, who they are, where they come from, and what they want. And I'm going to read a conversation from Don DeLillo's Underworld, published in 1997. Uh, it's almost completely dialogue, so I'm not even going to set it up. I'll just read it from page 116. I stood in the doorway watching the movie with her. Will Jeff be living with us forever, do you think? Could happen. The job at the diet ranch fell through, I guess. He didn't say? I'm watching this, she said. Did you do the newspapers? I did the bottles. Tomorrow's bottle day. Let me watch this, she said. We'll both watch it. You don't know what's going on. I've been watching for an hour and a quarter. I'll catch up. I don't want to sit here and explain. You don't have to say a word. The movie's not worth explaining, she said. I'll catch up by watching. But you're interfering, she said. I'll be quiet and I'll watch. You're interfering by watching, she said. The remark pleased her. It had a tinge of insight. And she stretched, smiling in a sort of coiled yawn, hips and legs steady, upper body bent away. I guess I knew what she meant, that another's presence screws up the steady balance, the integrated company of the box. She wanted to be alone with a bad movie, and I was standing judgment. You work too hard, I told her. I love my job, shut up. Now that I've stopped working too hard, you work too hard. I'm watching this. You work unnecessarily hard. If he, tries to kill her, if he tries to kill her, I'm going to be very upset. Maybe he'll kill her off camera. Off camera, fine. He can use a chainsaw, as long as I don't have to see it. OK, so he, he goes away and then comes back. I'm going to skip to the next part of the dialogue. I stood in the doorway again. Marion watched TV, body and soul. She lit another cigarette, and I went into the bedroom. I stood looking at the books on the shelves. Then I got undressed and went to bed. She came in about 15 minutes later. I waited for her to start undressing. What do I detect? What do you mean, she said. Between you and Brian? What do you mean, she said. What do I detect? That's what I mean. He makes me laugh, she said finally. He makes his wife laugh too, but I don't detect anything between them. <laughs> She thought about ways to reply to this. It was an amusing remark, perhaps, not what I'd intended. She looked at me and walked out of the room. I heard the shower running across the hall, and I realized I'd done it all wrong. I should have brought up the subject standing in the doorway while she was watching TV. Then I could have been the one who walks out of the room. So, um, it's, it's sort of incredible. With almost no exposition, he tells us an enormous amount on the level of story. We know that the couple is long married, they have a domestic routine, there have been changes in their work lives, her desire has moved outside the marriage, 
and also we have a sense of the differences between them. He is an analyzer and she comes across, it, across as more impulsive and emotional. And existentially, again, it delineates the narrator's state so beautifully. He's alone and he understands his wife, but somehow he can't possess her, maybe because he understands her and she shrinks from that. So all of this is animating these barely two pages of material. Finally, I, I, should I do my last bit about, all right. So I'm, I'm gonna address the issue of likability. To me, likability is right up there with consistency as an extremely <laughs> unhelpful notion. I don't think that characters need to be likable. <laughs> Some of my readers disagree. Um, and I'm actually wary of the term because it sounds to me like a code for blandness and simplicity. However, I do believe very strongly in attending to the humanity of anyone you're writing about and avoiding contempt or ridicule. Uh, I don't want to, I don't have to want to be friends with the people I read about, but I do crave a sense of what it feels like to be them, their history, their habits of mind, and some sense of what's driving them and why. So I'm going to read um, from Robert Stone's novel, A Flag for Sunrise. Um, I'm going to read, it's, this, this section concerns an extremely unlikable character. And I'm going to read, pause in the middle, and talk about different ways that I think Stone is subtly humanizing this guy, even as we can see that he's sort of a nightmare. Um, and then read to the end and talk a teeny bit more about it. Um, okay, so. <clears throat> At the end of the roadway was a small square bungalow with some wooden dog pens outside it. Tabor parked in the muddy yard by the pens. As soon as he was out of the car, the dogs set up a barking. Hello, dogs, he said. His own two short hairs were in the nearest pen, beside themselves at the sight of him, pressing their noses against the chicken wire, rearing and scratching against the boards of the pen gate. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Tabor said. He took his 12-gauge Remington from its cardboard box in the trunk, assembled it and stuffed his pockets with shells. The disk of the sun was over the horizon. He put his sunglasses on. Freed, the short hairs made a lightning circuit of the yard and hurried back to Deboer, bounding at his shoulders, climbing his legs until he put a knee up to force them down. Get down, fuckers, he told them. What do you think you're doing? What do you think you're doing, huh? An old black man came out of the bungalow holding a coffee pot in his hand. Gonna take him out? He asked, glancing at Tabor's Saturday night clothes. Sure am, Tabor said. He gave the old man three dollars, the dog's boarding fee. Tabor lived in a trailer court where they didn't allow dogs. They've been good dogs, the old man said. Good dogs. He followed the old man into the kitchen and accepted a half cup of coffee. See any birds, Tabor asked. Let's see, I seen one, two, up the other side of the airfield, that dry ground, brush up there. Didn't have my gun at the time. Too bad, Tabor said. The old man watched him take two pills from the aspirin bottle and swallow them with his coffee. I might have a shot at one of those airplanes back there, Tabor said. Piss me off with the noise they make, scaring the cows and the dogs. Don't do that now. Tabor set the cup down and picked up his gun. I've been wasting my time around this place, Tabor told the old man, wasting the best years of my life, no shit. You got that feeling, huh? He sat waiting for Tabor to take his dogs and go. I expect that's cause you a young man. Be restless, nervous in the service, ha <laughs> ha. Nervous in the service, Tabor repeated in a lifeless voice. Well, I'll see you. So he's, he's, pretty alienating and somewhat threatening. He's carrying a shotgun, popping pills, um, and seems to be have, have a strong potential for violence. But at the same time, we know a lot of other things that, that contradict that and, and make, it, make the portrayal more nuanced. We know that he lives in a place that won't allow dogs, but he pays to board the dogs and visits them routinely. Clearly, they matter to him. The dogs are beside themselves at the sight of him suggesting that Pablo and his dogs have had good times in the past, although he feels more critical of them now. The dogs are described with great tenderness, um, which suggests the history of Pablo's tenderness with them. 
There is a sense from the beginning that this day is extraordinary. It's exactly the opposite of the situation in Reese's book, where it feels like this is another iteration of a pattern that's been enacted before. This time, Pablo is in his Saturday night clothes. The old man notices that. Um, and, and Pablo actually says, I've been wasting my time, wasting the best years of my life, which is sad. Um, so, but, but the fact that he has kind of a routine with the old man, he goes in and has a cup of coffee, um, we feel the old man struggling to normalize the conversation, all of which suggests that the two of them have had other conversations in the past that were normal, and that this is a departure from that. I'm going to read a sort of a slightly edited, sorry, Robert Stone, version, uh, you know, rendering of the end, end of the section. Um, the dogs, who dreaded his anger, took off through the grass, circled back to the trail, and ran ahead looking busy. They had been good dogs to start with, but they were too rarely hunted, gone to seed. Fucking morning, Tabor said. Very far from God this morning, he said. The second rush of speed began to jangle him. Very far from you this morning, God. The morning sun was rising, well, I'm sorry, the morning sun was raising the sweat beneath his shirt, but his limbs felt cold and unconnected. If I were God, Pablo, thought, Pablo Tabor thought, I wouldn't have mornings like this. The sun up on a swamp, two worthless dogs, a sparky with his blood full of speed and gasoline. No such morning could have God over it. If I were God, he thought, if I made mornings, I wouldn't have no Pablo Tabor and his dogs in them. You do this, God? He asked. You operate and maintain mornings like this? He came to a fork in the road. He came to a fork in the raised trail, and the dogs ran off to the right, toward the deeper swamp where the game was. Tabor turned left toward the shore. After a few minutes, the puzzled dogs fell in behind him. Then, scenting the carrion of the beach, they whipped forward, running together. The sun was partly in his eyes. His rush came up speckled, buzzing in his brain. Old rages rose in his throat. Tasting the anger, he clenched his teeth. He walked down the beach, away from the sun, then stood with his eyes closed, his shotgun resting on his neck and shoulders, his forearms curled over it. His heart was throbbing in his side, in his temple, under his jaw. He eased the gun down and propped the stock against his thigh. From the jacket pocket, he fished out two of the red and gold cartridges, forced them into the magazine of his shotgun, pumped them into place, then a third inserted it, and pumped it forward. The dogs had found the shell of a horseshoe crab and were worrying it, trying to lift it from the sand with their soft retriever's teeth. Tabor watched them. If I moved, he thought, it would be like this. The anger fell away from him as he raised the gun. He felt as though he were a metal image of himself, cool without much reality, like this. The charge drove the male dog's head down into the wet sand, sent the rest of its body swinging on the pivot of its nearly severed neck to splash in the ebbing of a faint gulf wave, blood on the shimmering, regular surface of the washed sand. Tabor, Tabor pumped the spent shell out. The female stood quivering at the shot, confused at what she saw, almost, it seemed, about to run. His second charge sent her into the air, and she fell, still quivering, across a bough of flotsam mangrove. He pumped the second shell out and licked his dry lips. You happy now, you fool? You just murdered your dogs? I feel fine, Tabor said. Just fine. But it was not true. They're fucking with my head this morning, he said. So, Obviously, again, unlikable by almost any standard, but we know that he believes in God and talks to him. We see that he is full of self-loathing, and he sees himself and his dogs as an abomination in the eyes of God. Um, and we also know that the drugs and his state of mind have basically made him feel alienated and detached from himself. That kind of his limbs feel cold and unconnected, and he actually kills his dogs in a, hypo a hypothetical state. If I moved, he thought, it would be like this. So in a way, what, what it, all of this tells us is not that we're wa exactly that we're watching an evil guy in action, which is to me kind of cartoonish and simple but that 
killing the dogs is in a way the beginning of a process of killing himself or his old life. There's a sense that he's crossed a, a, a line, he can never go back, and that this will probably end with his own death, all of which is true. So it's uncomfortable, it's painful to read, it's ugly, but it is strong and complex characterization, a very a humane portrait of someone made ugly and inhuman by pain, alienation, and mental duress. And that is as likable as I need him to be.